If a product is not following regulations, then it's a little bit sus because if they're not following like labeling regulations, marketing regulations, then chances are they're also skipping a lot of steps in the process of making the safe product. So things like stability testing, microbiological testing, like testing for levels of bacteria and mold in the product. So yeah, I would actually be a bit more suspicious of a product that has too many free from claims. Welcome to The Proof Podcast a space for science-based conversation exploring the health and longevity benefits that come with mastering nutrition, physical exercise, mindfulness, recovery, sleep, and alignment. Facts, nuance, and trustworthy recommendations, minus the hyperbole. Hi friends, great to be here with you. I'm your host, Simon Hill. I'm a qualified physiotherapist and nutritionist with an undergraduate science degree and a master's in the science of human nutrition. Today, I sit down with Michelle Wong, PhD, for part two of our conversation, this time the focus being on skincare, hair care, and deodorant. Do we need to be worried about common ingredients such as parabens, pegs, and EDTAs? Is clean or natural skincare better than traditional skincare? Can you find effective skincare in your pharmacy, chemist, or grocery store? Or do you have to shop at more premium retailers? How important is the input amount of specific ingredients? Are ingredients like niacinamide, vitamin C, and retinol good for our skin? We cover all of this and more. And perhaps paradoxical to the theme of this episode, do we place too much value in beauty and our appearance? Are we being sucked into a giant marketing campaign that leaves us feeling inadequate and forever feeling like we must have every new product we see in order to feel better about ourselves and be accepted by the world? As always, all references are included in the show notes. And if you want to watch this, you can do so on YouTube, where full-length videos of each episode of The Proof can be found. Please do enjoy. This is me and Michelle Wong, PhD. Hey, Michelle. Welcome back. I'm looking forward to discussing skincare, hair care, and deodorants with you today. Yeah. Nice to see you again, Simon. I saw that you put up a video, I think, yesterday. I think it was yesterday. It might have been the day before that. It was a lady uh, in the video uh, making a lot of claims about various ingredients in dry shampoo, I think, and and how dangerous they are, and and then says this is why I made the switch to to clean beauty, which we sort of I think we indirectly spoke about this last episode when we were talking about mineral versus traditional sunscreens, but I thought this actually could be a good place to to start here. This idea of clean beauty. When we when we hear brands or folks online say clean beauty, what does what does this actually mean? That is an excellent question because there isn't really an agreed upon definition of clean beauty. So very high level, the idea is that A lot of beauty products have lots of toxic ingredients in them, which isn't true, but I will probably go into that a bit further, but that's the general claim anyway. And these supposedly clean beauty products don't contain these ingredients. Now, the problem is um, with anything, how dangerous it is depends on how much you get, how you're exposed to it. So for example, water. Um, If I drink tons of water, then I'll um, probably have a seizure if I inhale. A bunch of water, I'll probably drown. But if I drink a glass, I am fine. Um, And it's the same idea with pretty much anything in the world. So if we have even something super toxic, so let's say Botox, for example, that is very safe in the hands of someone who's qualified, who injects it in the right place at a really tiny dose, even though it is one of the most toxic chemicals on the planet. Um, And so, yeah, so as you would expect, these clean beauty brands, because they don't look at what the dose is, they only look at what the ingredient is. No one's really agreed on a list of substances that are dirty. And so every clean beauty brand seems to have a different list. And then sometimes if they have a particular ingredient in their product that they can't get rid of, they just won't include it in their dirty list. Mm -hmm. So can I ask you a question? Is it, is it, Certain ingredients are beneficial. So you mentioned Botox there, that up to a certain threshold, they're actually beneficial for us from a sort of molecular physiological point of view. And then above a certain level of exposure, they can become harmful. 
That's partly it, but it's also where it goes. So, for example, um, even with Botox, um, the point of it is that it basically cuts off your muscle from the nerve cell. Um, and that means that the nerves don't trigger that muscle. And so you don't frown and you don't um, cause wrinkles in motion, basically. Like when you frown, you end up with extra wrinkles. And yeah, that sort of flattens out your forehead, for example. But if the practitioner isn't very good and they inject it in the wrong place, even though it's the same amount, they might freeze the wrong muscle. It might end up... Um, in your bloodstream, and then that's not good. So even um, with the same amount, a lot of it is to do with how it's used. And in cosmetic ingredients, um, in a cosmetic product, let's say a skincare cream, some of those ingredients actually aren't good for us specifically in any amount. So for example, preservatives, um, they don't really benefit our bodies. What they do is they make sure that bacteria and mold inside the product don't grow. And that's what's actually going to harm us if we have a product without these preservatives. Mm -hmm. So in that instance, although that ingredient is not inherently beneficial for our physiology, it's it's creating a net positive by being included in that formula because the risk is if there are no preservatives and this product becomes you know, has bacteria in it, that would then negatively affect our health. Exactly. Got you. Okay. And you, you sort of alluded to the fact there's no real definition of clean beauty. So, so nobody is sort of regulating that? Not really. So I guess there are specific stores that have their own list. So Sephora, for example, they um, have a lot of influence over the beauty industry because they're such a big retailer and they have their Sephora clean list. Um, there are other organisations like I think Credo, um, the EWG, they all have their specific lists. But again, they don't agree either because there's no real good um, definition that reflects reality. So, yeah, they are usually the list that people go off. Um, otherwise, yeah, there just isn't really an agreed upon list. Right. And and what about the idea of, of I guess, something being natural versus unnatural? I'm sure that comes up quite a bit. Um, is that Does that tie into the clean beauty message that all of the ingredients are naturally sourced versus synthetic? A lot of the time with clean beauty, um, they say that it doesn't matter. But at the same time, if you look at the actual list, a lot of the time there is that appeal to nature bias. So something that is natural tends to end up on the clean list. Something that's synthetic tends to end up on the dirty list. And I think it is that sort of stranger danger feeling. Mm -hmm. The EWG, we may have spoken about them in the last episode. And, you know, they... They're a, a group that looks at, um, I guess, um, well, in food, they look at the pesticides and, and herbicides and a number of people have, have had a lot to comment on the kind of work that they've done there. But I believe they also have a, a skin deep database, which um, at least the way they position it is to help people with uh, choosing their skincare products. If someone's come across the EWG, that skin, skin deep database, what what would you like to kind of make them aware of with regards to how useful that is as a resource? I think it's pretty similar to how it is in food. Um, a lot of it is based on very preliminary studies. So a lot of the time they'll go and find an animal study, for example, where they fed way too much of, an, of a cosmetic ingredient to a rat. And without any sort of extra interpretation, they'll stick that in the database and say, this is clearly going to be a cancer hazard because it caused cancer in rats when you fed them 300 times the amount that you would ever use in a cosmetic. Um, and therefore, we're going to rate it dirty. Like we'll rate it a seven out of 10, bright red, um, super dangerous, big like siren warning signs. And that's just not the correct interpretation of that study. Like sometimes if you even go into the study, you'll find that the researchers actually say um, these amounts would not be expected um, in regular human exposure in a sunscreen, for example. Um, so yeah, a lot of the database is just not based on any sort of scientific principles of toxicology. Um, most of the time, I think they did a survey of toxicologists at one point and they asked them whether or not they agreed with the EWG's conclusions. And it was something like, I can't remember the exact numbers, but most of the toxicologists were saying, no, this is not a credible source. 
Um, so yeah, I would not trust the SkinD database at all, but it is a very efficient marketing tool because they have a really nice app. Um, you can see a very nice, simple numbered system, but it just doesn't reflect reality. It is just like a really convenient marketing lie. Mm -hmm. Okay. So thresholds matter and where ingredients get to matters. And then there are some ingredients that are not inherently beneficial for us, but may may have a beneficial effect within a formulation, as you mentioned, to help um, with shelf life, for example. Um, but I, I still come across a lot of information and I'll even have friends, you know, mention uh, various things that they've heard or what they look for when they're buying products, for example. And, um, you know, I think, I think a large deal of people have heard about pegs and parabens and EDTAs, for example, and and are kind of of the view or have been have been led to believe that you should be looking for products that are free of these things. So, are there any ingredients, common ingredients that are used where you would say, you know what, you'd be better off finding an alternative that doesn't have those ingredients? Or are these common ingredients that pop up that you do see a lot of brands marketing sort of free from parabens or free from pegs, et cetera? Um, are some of these ingredients, in fact, things that we do want to avoid because at a physiological level, the dose that's used in certain products could be carcinog carcinogenic or could disrupt hormones? So one of the really annoying things about, I guess, anything in cosmetics and really most things in life is that we don't have a ton of certainty about whether or not there'll be a study in the future that finds that something is going to be more dangerous than we initially thought. Um, and this is just, yeah, a fact of life and science. There's always more to be found. Um, and there's always the possibility something will be found. But the amounts that are allowed in ingredients and that are commonly used in ingredients are the amounts that, according to the current scientific evidence we have, is safe. Now, um, there is a lot of talk about um, different regions and how they have different regulations, but the truth is whenever there is any piece of new scientific evidence that comes out about an ingredient, then um, the more, I guess, well-regulated regions um, which are like the EU, the US, Australia, um, that sort of thing, um, they are going to look at that new piece of evidence, put it into context, and then change their recommendations. And even though technically, I guess, there isn't like um, set percentages enshrined into law in a lot of places, people, um, well, large cosmetic manufacturers and um the makers of cosmetic ingredients and then the cosmetic chemists who follow their guidelines, they are going to follow the best practices because at the end of the day, it is a really bad business practice to accidentally kill your customers. Like you cannot recover from that. So even from like a purely like market forces, capitalist sort of angle, um, companies are going to try to put out safe products, even if it wasn't enshrined in law, which it is. Um, so yeah, so in general, there is nothing in cosmetic products that, as a blanket rule, everyone should avoid. Now, more specifically, um, if you're allergic to an ingredient, you should obviously avoid it, even if everyone else can use it. Um, there are some ingredients in products that are slightly worse if your skin is sensitive, um, so they might be more irritating. Sometimes it's a temporary effect. So, for example, alcohol in a product, that will give a temporary stinging effect. From the evidence, it doesn't look like it does anything long term, um, as long as you like moisturize afterwards or have other moisturizers in the product. Um, but it will hurt a bit, and that's probably not the nicest thing um, to experience on a daily basis. Mm -hmm. um, there are some other ingredients where um, there's quite a bit of evidence that a lot of people develop an allergy. And the one that really comes to mind is, I'm probably going to mess this up, but it is methyl isothiazolinone um, and methyl, methyl chloro isothiazolinone. Yeah, so these are um, abbreviated as MI and MCI. And yeah. these two are preservatives um, that have kind of come into products to replace parabens because parabens have gotten such bad press, even though they are very, very safe and very non-allergenic. Um, so MI and MCI, I think they have an allergy prevalence of about 10% in the general population. 
and you can become sensitized to it if you've been exposed for a long time, which happens not just in beauty products, but also in laundry detergents. And so if you have any sort of sensitive skin issue, if you're having um, an unknown reaction to something and you're not sure what it is, that would probably be one of the top suspects. Right. Yeah. Coming back to, I guess, some some of those earlier ingredients like pegs and EDTA and, and parabens. Um, and I appreciate you said that there's there's always a level of uncertainty. So with much of what we're, the decisions we're kind of making, it's always a, a risk reward ratio, right? So um, there could be a degree of risk, but what is the reward here? And And where I'm going with that is I could see someone take a precautionary approach here and say, you know what, I'm just going to avoid those. But what I'd be interested in understanding is are actually some of those ingredients more effective? So from a reward point of view, in terms of our skincare and um, the solutions we're looking for or the preventative health aspect, are some of those ingredients actually superior and more effective than the natural um, alternatives that would be used otherwise? Yeah, um, you've hit on a really good point. One of the reasons that a lot of these ingredients became demonized in the first place is because they were very popular in products. And the reason they were so popular is because they were very, very good in those products. So parabens, for example, parabens are excellent preservatives in that you only need a very small amount to have that preservative effect to kill lots of bacteria and fungi. And they work at lots of different pHs. They're very, um, they're very robust preservatives. And they also have a really low allergenicity and irritancy rating. So most people, like they are better than pretty much most preservatives in that respect. So they were super popular. And because they were so popular, they got a lot of scrutiny um, and they got more scientists studying them, for example. And so that has also turned into the fact that like, um, even if you look at all the studies, there are a lot of them and a lot of them do find certain harmful effects of parabens. Um, if you look at the percentage of them and how that compares to um, how the amounts used in these studies compared to what's used in products, then like the big picture is that parabens are actually really safe. But unfortunately, organizations like the EWG who just look at number of studies without any sort of um, nuanced interpretation, then to them, it just looks like there are a lot of studies um, that say that parabens are bad without looking like at like the rate of the studies or um, or even considering the fact that a lot of these studies, they are pretty much increasing the amount of parabens until they find the toxic point. Mm -hmm. um, the point of it is that they find where the line of toxicity is. And so in the studies, they are purposely looking for that. And so you would expect most of the studies to find a toxic point, even if it is so much higher than anything you would even use in your entire lifetime. So, um, yeah, so one of the reasons is like greater scrutiny. And this actually, um, even from that risk standpoint, a lot of these ingredients that have been demonized are actually less risky because a lot of their replacements just haven't been studied as much. And so there's a lot of unknown risk around them. Whereas with parabens, for example, they are probably the most scrutinized preservatives. And so we actually have a really good idea of what their risk profile is. Whereas, yeah, newer ones, that data just doesn't exist. Yeah, that was my question. So if not parabens, I'm assuming there's some form of natural concentrated preservative that has to be put in there. And so what I'm hearing from you is that some of those ingredients, whilst they're natural, they may not have been put through the same degree of kind of scrutiny in terms of a scientific process to see how they affect our physiology. Yeah, exactly. And also, even then, some of the replacements have also been on this sort of treadmill where um, the replacements are now getting fear-mongered about. So things like phenoxyethanol, which has been, come, like, it's been a replacement. It is, I believe it's not quite natural, but it's natural adjacent. Um, and so that's also getting a whole bunch of scrutiny. So that probably will be okay. out. And then an even newer one with even less data will probably come in. Right. And I... I know that you said um, companies are, 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 it's not in their best interest to kind of give their customers a disease or, or kill kill them. Um, but I guess someone may be thinking, yeah, well, you know, it might take 10, 20, 30 years for that to happen. How are you going to trace that back to that product? 
But I would think that companies are very motivated by more immediate things. So how effective is their product? Because that's going to drive repeat sales. Um, and also cost. Is it cheaper to use some of these ingredients than, than to use the natural alternatives? Sometimes. Um, yeah, so it really depends. There's a lot of variation with how expensive different products are. Um, and a lot of it is to do with how resource intensive they are to produce. So a lot of the time, not always, um, cheaper ingredients are less um, have a lower environmental impact, which is becoming a bigger thing now as well. Mm-hmm. What about PFAs? That's something that I've come across. Is that is that a, a compound that you've come across? I've heard people say to kind of look out for it and, and avoid it. Yeah, so PFAS, um, perfluoroalkylated substances, um, that's a family of ingredients. Um, one of them um, is Teflon. Basically, it's just stuff with tons of fluorines on them. They are they have a lot of really good properties, so they're really waterproof. Um, they have high chemical resistance, which is why they became so popular. The problem is they have been linked to a lot of toxic effects, um, toxic health effects. It's not really well characterized, but it looks like they are bad for you. Um, and, yet yeah, they've come on the scrutiny in cosmetic products as well. Mm-hmm. Um, the thing is... They're not that common in cosmetics, and that's not our main exposure. The main exposure a lot of the time is in food and drink. Mm-hmm. Um, so, yeah, okay. in cosmetic products, um, they're usually not listed, and they're usually a contaminant because PFAS is like a really common environmental contaminant. It's in everything. It's just everywhere. Mm-hmm. Um, and so, yeah, un- like unsurprisingly, they've also found their way into cosmetics. Um, sometimes they are added intentionally and it looks like the products that have the highest PFAS are um, long wear makeup products. So things like foundation and long wear lipstick, I believe were the two highest. Now PFAS, because of their chemical properties, they don't go through skin very easily. So the biggest risk is probably eating slash breathing it in. Mm -hmm. And so if you're worried, I would probably say the number one product to avoid is long wear lipstick because you can eat that. Um, And then, yeah, also maybe long wear foundation or at least maybe limit it to when you're actually going to like really need them. Maybe don't have them as your everyday products. Mm -hmm. But yeah, food and water is probably a bigger source of concern than cosmetics, I would say. That's a that's a good tip about the lipstick there. So if I'm at the at the cosmetic shop or the the grocery store or pharmacy chemist, whatever, and and looking for a skincare product and I'm I've heard everything you're saying here, I turn around a product, it does look like another language off in the ingredient list. There's a, there's a lot of long, long words. And I think at face value, that just scares a lot of people straight away. Um is there anything that I'm looking for kind of that's a clear identifier, know something or a certain ingredient that is going to give me confidence that this is a, a safe product or is there anything I, I really want to see where that a product says no and then a certain ingredient um, or how am I going about assessing, I guess, the, the sort of safety of a product that I pick up? I would say if a product actually has a free-from claim, I would be slightly more suspicious of it. And the reason is um, free-from claims have actually been, um, there's been a guideline from the EU, from their regulators that says that free-from claims are should be illegal. Um, Now, the way that the EU law works is that they can't say that it is illegal. Um, So it's really a guideline for the courts to interpret um, how they would what they would, yeah, whether or not they would see that as dishonest, um, misleading advertising. And so um, I do tend to feel that, well, one one tip from cosmetic chemists is that if a product is um, not following regulations, then it's a little bit sus because if they're not following like labeling regulations, marketing regulations, 
then chances are they're also skipping a lot of steps in the process of making the safe product. So things like um, stability testing, microbiological testing, like testing for levels of bacteria and mold in the product. So yeah, I would actually be a bit more suspicious of a product that has too many free from claims. But I think at the same time, um, the market has sort of pressured a lot of companies, even really big companies who hire hundreds of scientists to put these claims on the product, even though they know that it's a pretty BS claim. Um, so, yeah, I would probably be suspicious if something says, like, free from too many things. Also, I think I think most people who know what a chemical is would know to be suspicious if a product says free from chemicals because they don't know what they're talking about. So, yeah, this is, like, a more advanced version of that. If they have too many free from claims, it's just they probably, uh, like, probably they're basing their product on, like, a not very scientific philosophy. So the chances that the product has stuff in it that actually works is going to be a lot lower if they're just chucking things out for no reason. Right. And just to kind of elaborate on that chemical point, um, you know, you're alluding to the fact that chemicals exist in nature, exist in our apples and oranges and food we eat. And just because something has a chemical doesn't mean it's harmful. Yeah, exactly. And also chemicals like water is a chemical. Um, so if it's free from chemicals, clearly they don't realise that water is a chemical. So what are the chances that they know how to assess whether an active ingredient is actually going to be good for your skin? Mm -hmm. What about fragrances? Is there is there a concern with added fragrances to, to cosmetic products? The main concern with fragrance is with allergies and sensitive skin. Um, there are some fragrance ingredients that are quite allergenic. So the word fragrance, it's a little bit of a, um, there's a lot of um, misinformation about fragrance. So a lot of the time, um, I guess the concern about the word fragrance is that it can hide, in quotation marks, hide um, a lot of different chemicals. So there's something like 3,000 different possible fragrance chemicals that can be in a fragrance. Um, and that's all within that word. And the reason it's hidden, um, a lot of people insinuate that it's some sort of um, conspiracy, that they're trying to poison you, et cetera. Um, but the reason it's hidden is because of um, how competitive the fragrance market is. Like there's so much money that goes into fragrances. All of these developed fragrances are massive trade secrets. Um, there are people who have been trained for decades to um, know how to smell different notes it's really, really, it's a fascinating world, but basically, yeah, all of that is hidden because they don't want other companies stealing their magical formula. Um, and a lot of this is because fragrance is such an important part of products. Like at the end of the day, as much as we try to be rational, a lot of us, like the way we make decisions are is based on impulses and emotions. Like you might hate strawberry ice cream because you you threw up once when you were a kid after it. And that that smell brings back that memory. And so even in um, market research testing, the first thing most consumers do is smell the product um, even before they try it on their skin or as they're trying it on their skin. So yeah, it is a massive selling point. Mm -hmm. um, the other thing is if you tried to list all the ingredients in a fragrance on the ingredients list, it would grow massive um, because a lot of these names are really long and there's so many ingredients to make a complex fragrance. Um, so it's just not really practical. But um, yeah, so the thing with the regulations around fragrances, there are these international um, associations. Um, the biggest one is IFRA and they pretty much regulate fragrances. They say um, fragrances should, should not contain too much of this ingredient because we know it's irritating, too much of this one because it's a potential um, endocrine disruptor, this is the limit. And almost every fragrance company in the world follows these limits because this organisation, like to join the organisation, you have to agree. Um, so there is regulation. Again, it's not, I guess it's not really like um, specific legal regulation, but it is like a professional body level of regulation, which is how a lot of the world actually works. Um, yeah, so that I guess that's what the main concerns. The concern from like a dermatological perspective is that fragrances are a relatively common allergen. Um, and because there are 3,000 different chemical um, fragrance ingredients, and if your product just says fragrance, you don't know if it contains the specific one that you are allergic to, so you may as well just avoid anything with fragrance. Um, 
Now, fragrance allergy isn't that high in the general population. I think it's something like less than 5%, maybe 2%. Yeah. Um, but if you are allergic, then it is pretty terrible because there's so many products with fragrance. It's really hard to find um, fragrance-free products. Um, but again, yeah, if you are allergic, avoid it. If you aren't, then you probably don't have to avoid it. If you start having a reaction, then maybe start trying out different products to see if they have fragrance, maybe go to a dermatologist for a, um, for a patch test. What's the reaction? Is that something that you observe on your skin or is it the way you feel like a headache or or how your you know, brain fog, et cetera? Um, the most common one is usually some sort of um, skin reaction. So redness, itching, a rash. Okay. Um, what about during pregnancy? Is there, are the, we, we've covered a number of different ingredients and, and you've kind of spoken to um, risk, reward. Last episode, we spoke a little bit about sunscreens during pregnancy, some things to think about. Is there anything extra that you would add on to say, okay, if someone's pregnant, then maybe look out for this? Um, so in general, most of the, with the vast majority of cosmetic ingredients, um, during the safety assessments, they usually test, um, they usually look at um pregnant animals and like risk during pregnancy. And that usually sets their limit because that is the most sensitive sort of population. Um, so in terms of safety, you generally don't have to worry too much. There are a few ingredients that um, are generally not recommended during pregnancy. Um, the first one is vitamin A on your skin. Um, now, the main issues with vitamin A, it's only really been observed with oral isotretinoin, which is um, also known as Accutane. It's an acne drug. Um, there actually haven't been any studies on skin absorption and just based on the amount that gets absorbed into skin, nothing should happen. Um, but doctors still recommend that you avoid it just in case. So I guess it is good to avoid it just in case, but if you've accidentally used it, then there's probably no need to freak out. The freaking out will probably be worse for your baby than however much you actually absorbed. Just quickly on, on that. So is it always written as vitamin A or could it be uh, could it be a different form in the ingredient list? So just, just so someone could actually identify if that product contains vitamin A. Yeah. So in the ingredients, it'll start with retin, like R-E-T-I-N. Um, so there's retinol, retinol palmitate, um, retinaldehyde. There's a whole bunch, but they start with retin. Um, the other ingredient that comes to mind is salicylic acid. Um, and that's to do with the fact that it is a salicylate, which can be linked to um, Ray syndrome. Again, it is very precautionary, but it's probably a good idea to avoid it just in case. And I mean, it's only nine months where you have to avoid it and there are alternatives you can use instead. Mm -hmm. And what's the benefit of that ingredient? What's the, the, the reason that that ingredient is used? I see that in marketing a little bit. Yeah, so salicylic acid is um, a keratolytic, which means that it helps dead skin cells come off. So, yeah, it's a chemical exfoliant. Um, so there's lots of um, different chemical exfoliants. So there's plenty of alternatives. Things like glycolic acid and lactic acid are good alternatives. Okay. Well, let's let's change gears a little bit and talk about the effective ingredients because there's a lot of marketing out there. I think um, we mentioned last episode, vitamin C and there's retinol, there's niacinamide, et cetera. So there's a lot of noise out there with regards to, okay, here's active ingredients that are beneficial. Then there's the whole discussion as to, well, what's the input amount, what's actually clinically effective. So I'd love to kind of cover this and perhaps a, a nice on-ramp is just at a, a high level, what what are the, the sort of main concerns, skin concerns or solutions that, that people are looking at? If you were to kind of think about it as an umbrella, what are the buckets that um, various products, I guess, are, are kind of targeting? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, so I guess like the main skin concerns overall, firstly, I think anti-aging is a really big one. Um, that's now being kind of rebranded into like well aging, I think, because um, anti aging kind of sounds like you want to die young, which I don't think anyone does really. Um, so, this can be split into a number of things. So, um, if you have whiter skin, generally the way you age is through wrinkles, um, fine lines, and wrinkles. If you have pigmented skin, then the main way that your skin looks older is through uneven pigment. 
Um, so, yes, we've got anti-wrinkle. We've got an, um, anti, I guess it's not really anti-pigment because, again, people with darker skin generally don't want to bleach their skin. It's usually more about um, brightening or evening out the pigment. Um, then we also have acne, which happens when you're a teenager, but also when you're older as well, like um, adult acne is a big thing now. Um, on top of that, you've also got things like um, if your skin is sensitive, so just trying to support your sensitive skin, trying to make your skin more resilient. Um, and then there's also oiliness. So whether your skin is too oily or too dry, um, it's not good. So yeah, there's lots of products that target that as well. Okay. So big picture here thinking about these different buckets. So we've got the well-aging, I do like that, um, acne, sensitive skin and oiliness. I'm sure there's there's more, but you're sort of talking about the big the big rocks here. How much of this is, is um, sort of pathological and due to a lack of products in our life versus you know, other parts of our lifestyle that are contributing to these things. So where's the where's the root cause do you feel of these product of these different concerns? The very root cause I would say is probably mostly genetics. Um, a lot of stuff is genetically controlled. And even if it's like something pathological, so for example, let's say PCOS tends to cause um, adult female acne, um, even that is generally there's a really, really big genetic component. So yeah, I guess a lot of skincare is really about trying to make your skin as like behave as well as possible within your genetic boundaries. And before we sort of jump into each of these, how much do we need to, or how much attention or thought do we need to give into, I guess, the skin's own um system for dealing with some of these things, the, the microbiome on the skin and 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 how different products may affect that. Is that something that you give thought to? I think, um, yeah. So I think a lot of people tend to unthinkingly just start using products and start using way too many products. Um, and not because they feel like their skin needs it, but just because they feel like they should be using something. And I think that's a really bad approach to skincare. I think... Um, and this happens a lot with marketing hype. And I guess that's the whole point of this sort of hype-based marketing. They want you to stop thinking and just buy. Um, and I think, yeah, it's important to pause. Um, and if you are using a lot of products and you're not really sure why you're using these products, um, one thing I do recommend, which I which is actually like the first step in my skincare ebook, um, is to just pause all your products and see how your skin behaves in its natural state because a lot of us have forgotten this. So pretty much just cut everything out of your skincare routine except sunscreen and a cleanser to get rid of the sunscreen and do this for a week or two and see where your baseline actually is. Because it is quite possible that the products you're using are actually aggravating your skin and throwing it off balance. And your skin, I mean, yeah, we, are, we have evolved over millions of years to become what we are. We have adapted a lot to our environment. We haven't entirely adapted to a lot of the things in modern life. Like if you have um, if you have lighter skin and you live in Australia, for example, we haven't really adapted to that level of sun. But um, our skin has evolved with the environment. And a lot of the time it can take care of itself quite well if we just leave it alone a bit. Mm -hmm. Interesting. So you could do a bit of a, a break from your products. And I'm sure there are a lot of folks that have a bunch of products, um, each with a lot of different claims and active ingredients and probably unsure of all of the active ingredients that they're putting on their, their face every day, is when we're thinking, considering these different ingredients and how they affect us, do we have to consider the, the combination? So is there any interaction between these ingredients? Are there certain actives that are are beneficial sort of when stacked on top of each other and then others that you may not want to combine? Um, short answer, yes. Um, both of those will happen. Um, I guess the main thing to look out for in terms of um, one ingredient cancelling other things out is benzoyl peroxide which is an acne treatment. It's very effective at just like using free radicals to kill off bacteria. Um, the problem is those free radicals also kill a lot of um, free active sensitive um, other ingredients. And so with benzoyl peroxide, my recommendation is just to use it in a cleanser. Um, it also destroys um, 
dye as well in fabric. So a lot of people who use it end up with like really discolored towels and pillowcases. So washing it off is a really good idea. And there's tons of products for this now. Um, so yeah, just kind of keep that away from everything else. Apart from that, there are a few minor things that can interact, but they're not like super, um, they're not that big an interaction. Okay. Um, at the end of the day, a lot of skincare, like skincare formulations are really complex and it can be hard to predict what they'll do from um, just from the sort of first principles where you're just looking at the ingredients and trying to work out what's going on. Um, so at the end of the day, one of the best things you can do is actually just try it out on your skin. So if you if there are two products that you think might be interacting, maybe just try one for a week, um, try them together for a bit and then try them apart and see if it makes any sort of difference. Talk to me about wrinkles. <laughs> so what... I guess from a pathological point of view or just an aging point of view, I guess it's not actually pathological perhaps. Um, it's part of being human and growing older, but what's what's happening at a, a cellular level and where are we trying to trying to kind of intervene to change the course of that process and and what active ingredients are most effective for that? Yeah, so with wrinkles, um, there's two main contributors to your skin um, changing its appearance as you get older. Firstly, there's um, intrinsic aging, which is just um, things happening inside your body. So this is things like changes in the levels of hormones, um, changes in how well you're, I mean, yeah, we all just sort of slowly kind of kind of break down as we get older and things just don't happen the way they do when they were younger. So the main things with skin, are, um, your skin stops producing um, as much collagen and the stuff that is in there just um, is degrading with things like um, oxidative stress, like cumulative oxidative stress, um, and also glycation, which is when um, excess sugar uh, binds itself to proteins and then they change the way they're shaped. And so if you have lots of these microscopic changes, it's reflected in like the macroscopic, the, um, the appearance of your skin. Um, on top of that, there's also things like uh, menopause um, so that your hormones will change. You won't produce as much oil um, and your skin doesn't renew itself as effectively. So you've got about 10 to 20 layers of dead skin cells on the surface of your skin, which act as a really nice barrier. Um, and this gets thinner as you get older and it also gets more uneven. So it doesn't, that layer of dead skin cells that should be shedding, one layer should be shedding per day. Um, that doesn't shed as evenly. Sometimes it doesn't shed as much. So that's intrinsic. There's also extrinsic aging, which is um, from environmental exposure. And the main issue with that is the sun and its UV. So this is also sometimes called photo aging. Basically, the UV is penetrating your skin and messing it up, whether it's through oxidative stress or through um, degrading your DNA. Um, which can lead to cancer. So yeah, these are all the influences. And so I guess the things you're trying to do to your skin is preserve the collagen that you already have um, and the elastin. These are proteins under the surface of the skin that um, give your skin its sort of bounce. Um, so it gives that elastic sort of recoil, like you press it down and then it comes back up. Um, also the thickness and the plumpness of the skin as well. And so, yeah, when that breaks down, that's when you start getting like, your skin sort of starts sagging like an old mattress and you get wrinkles. Um, so that's the first thing. Um, the second thing that you're trying to do is usually try to get that cell renewal going. Um, those dead skin cells um, renewing themselves as effectively as they were when you were younger. Um, yeah, so those are the two main targets. I guess with there's also pigment. Um, UV also causes in, um, increased pigment and uneven pigment, um, and that also happens from internal causes as well. And so, yeah, evening out pigment. So, yeah, those are probably the three mm -hmm. main things. Part of that um, kind of, I guess, sagging or less volume as you age, do do humans, as, as they get older, as we get older, is there less sort of fat storage in the face or is that just something I'm kind of imagining? Oh, no, that is that is there as well. Um, we just tend not to talk as much with that in skincare because we can't really affect the fat. It's lower than the, um, the dermis, which is where the collagen and elastin are. So because it's even lower than that, the fat, like it's even less likely that something you put on the surface will impact that. Yeah, so that is usually the realm of cosmetic surgery. Um there are a few creams that are claiming that they can do things to fat, but 
I would A, be suspicious that they can do anything, and then B, if they worked, I would be quite concerned because that is penetrating quite deep. Yeah, I mean, I, I think of that because if you look at that, you know, bodybuilders, for example, or anyone who gets super lean, they often do look a lot sort of older in the face when when they've become super, super lean. So um, it's just interesting sort of observation. With regards to preserving collagen and elastin, so these proteins, um, talk to me about the difference between, say, ingestible collagen or topical collagen or what we're trying to do through cosmetics to actually uh, help preserve those proteins. Yeah, so collagen um, production pretty much starts going down when you're about 30. Um, and so, yeah, you're getting less of this um, basically bulk in your skin, like nice bouncy bulk. Um, elastin is kind of worse. You are kind of stuck with the amount of elastin you have when you are a kid. And so um, the main issue with elastin is that the sun gets in and messes up the structure um, and that accumulates um, throughout your life. So a lot of this is about prevention. Prevention is always better. So that's the sunscreen part. Um, you can also use antioxidants to try to reduce some of that oxidative stress. Um, so the main antioxidants that are good for that are um, vitamin C. Vitamin E can work as well. But yeah, the most of the evidence is based around vitamin C. Um, with the other antioxidants, it's a bit less well established. So a lot of the time, you just kind of have antioxidants in your products and hope for the best with that. Um, in terms of um, putting collagen on your skin in a product, that is not going to work. Um, collagen is really big and it can't get through your skin um, into that deeper layer. So collagen in a product will just sit on the surface and it will be a good hydrator. Um, it'll just act as a moisturizer, but you're not adding extra collagen to your skin. Mm -hmm. With skincare, to add extra collagen, you are looking for ingredients that will increase collagen production in like a more signaling sort of way. And the main ingredient for that is um, vitamin A derivatives like retinol, retinaldehyde, um, maybe prescription options like tretinoin as well. Um, vitamin C seems to be able to do it a bit. The problem with vitamin C is that vitamin C is really unstable. And so trying to find a stable product is always a bit of a crapshoot. Um, so I would probably just recommend going for um, a product from a brand that has a really good track record of research. Um, so this is usually from like a multinational brand, something under like, let's say the L'Oreal umbrella. Um, the product that probably has the most research around it is SkinCeuticals. Mm -hmm. um, the founder of SkinCeuticals, um, he actually did a lot of the original research on vitamin C and then he started a company out of it. Um, and that's been acquired by L'Oreal now. The problem is those products are very expensive. They cost an arm and a leg. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, I think with vitamin C, just try to buy it from a reputable brand and that will probably help. Um, Can I just... I Yes. I have to comment on that. So I was given a gift um, and it is from SkinCeuticals and I have no affiliation with this company whatsoever. I literally was given this product. Someone said it would be um, useful and I'm looking at it now. I thought I, I might bring this up, but it, it sort of uh, seems like a good point to do that here. It has 10% L-ascorbic acid, uh, which is vitamin C, right? And it's, it also has 0.5% ferulic acid as well. This um, gets me wondering about a few things here. So how important is not only the brand and their reputation, but the input amount? So when we see ingredients like uh, retinol or vitamin E or vitamin C, these ones you're talking about, is there a certain kind of percentage that we should be looking for that is it has been supported by evidence is clinically effective dose. And second to that, with any of these ingredients, um, is it a daily thing? Is it twice daily? I've heard people say with retinol, um, depending on your skin, maybe it's something that you're only having a few times a week or putting on a few times a week. How, how do we kind of know uh, where to fit this into a skincare routine? 
Okay, you've brought up a lot of really, um, really interesting and somewhat complex points. So let's start with the percentage question. Um, so percentages are important, but at the same time, um, skincare products are really complex. And part of this is because the skin is a good barrier. And so a lot of formulas have to be very carefully optimized to try to get the ingredients into the skin as effectively as possible. And this varies a lot. And so sometimes you'll get like a 1% retinol product where not much will get delivered through. And so you actually need to, to start off with 1%. Um, and sometimes you'll get like a 0.5% retinol product that has a good delivery system. And that will actually get more retinol through the skin than your 1% crappier product. And then, yeah, the 0.5% should also have less irritation because your active ingredient is getting into your skin to where it needs to be rather than like just kind of blasting your skin in ineffective ways. Um, and so, yeah, percentages are somewhat important, but if it's a brand that you trust, then um a brand that has a lot of clinical research behind them, then chances are that percentage is not that important and you can just trust the brand. Um, there's also the issue of stability, which I brought up before as well. Um, vitamin C and vitamin A are also quite unstable. And so even if it says 1%, there's a good chance that if it's a brand that hasn't put a lot of effort into making a stable formula, a lot of that 1% may have degraded by the time it gets to you. Um, and there was a study where um, some scientists looked at how much vitamin A was left in a bunch of different products on the market, and it was highly variable. Um, so I think they were looking at, um, there are some products where after six months, there is like 5% of the original retinol left. And so again, yeah, that percentage would not be a great guide. Um, but yeah, with some simpler formulas, so vitamin C, really basic vitamin C serums and with chemical exfoliants, then percentages can be a bit more useful because the formulas are simple enough that, mm -hmm. yeah, there isn't that much variation between different brands. Mm -hmm. So with vitamin C, um, like L-ascorbic acid water-based serums, um, a good percentage is somewhere around between 5 and 20%. Mm -hmm. So yeah, 10% is a it's like, I guess, a slightly weaker on the weak end of the range, but it is an effective percentage. Um, and it's from SkinCeuticals, which are probably the most um, reputable vitamin C brand in the world. So that would be an effective product. Um, the ferulic acid is actually in there to stabilize it. So they're actually also showing off the fact that they have stabilized it. Mm -hmm. um, now, with the question about, um, what's Frequency. the other one? Frequency, yes. Um, so one of the problems with frequency is that when you look at the scientific studies, most of the studies, they are testing that product on its own, much like with um, drug trials. So a lot of them are based around drug trials. They're in peer-reviewed journals. And so the protocol is they have a washout period where they use nothing, and then they start using that product once a day or twice a day with nothing else but a cleanser, maybe a sunscreen. So um, those trials tend to never put that product in the context of a skincare routine. And so all their findings on efficacy are based on that product alone, which is really good. But then their findings on irritancy is based on that product alone, which is completely unrealistic. And it's going to be like a best case scenario. Mm -hmm. um, so I think with the more effective ingredients, the ones with greater um, efficacy evidence like vitamin A, vitamin C, um, chemical exfoliants, you will probably get better results if you use them every day. But then the caveat is that if they're too irritating, then your skin is probably not going to be happy. You're probably going to get a lot of stinging. Um, your skin might just be red all the time and it could be bad for your skin in the long run to always have it in that state of irritation um, and just permeability. Um, so my general advice is if you're using irritating products, um, add them to your routine slowly mm -hmm. and try to see how your skin reacts. And then if your skin starts getting irritated, um, maybe pull back a bit. And then once it's calmed down, try to build it up again. A lot of the time there is an adjustment period, especially with vitamin A and with chemical exfoliants. And so it is possible that like if you build up slowly, you can use it every day. But if you just start off every day, then your skin is just going to be a mess. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Okay. So you can build up some tolerance over time with these things. You mentioned that skin SkinCeuticals, um, or you mentioned that sort of starting from the 
the position of finding a reputable brand is often a mm. good place here and 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 perhaps not getting so uh, worried about the percentages. Skinceuticals is expensive, right? Yes. So <laughs> my question here is, does price indicate effectiveness always or is there a lot of kind of marketing and perceived value um, or is it a good rule of thumb to go out and just say, okay, well, if that product's more expensive, it's going to be superior? That's the first question. And second, if someone has more of a budget, a constrained budget, um, are there brands out there that um, you would say, this is a good example of a brand that actually has very affordable products, but they are guided by the science and have um, formulations that are clinically effective? Yeah. Um, so I think this is the case for most things in life. More expensive does not always mean better. Um, however, sometimes um, if a brand is too low budget, then a lot of the time they haven't done a lot of um, optimization and clinical testing. Um, so yeah, I think I probably have to disclose that I have um, done sponsored posts with a lot of brands on the market, including SkinCeuticals, including some of the ones that I'm going to mention that are like budget-friendly um, alternatives. However, a lot of this stuff I have been saying well before I was getting paid by any of these brands, like SkinCeuticals, I've been saying this forever. So um, yeah. All right. So um, one of the um, brands that's a really good alternative to the high price products that will work really well um, or can work really well is The Ordinary. So The Ordinary, they, they pretty much have budget-friendly versions of every single product. Um, they have, uh, but their, their uh, model is sort of based around, they just dump in a percentage of an active ingredient and hope for the best. Um, they're starting to do more clinical studies, which is really cool because they've got the budget for that now that they've managed to move a lot of product. Um, but they've only just started doing that. And so a lot of their products, either they, um, so I believe their retinol is still really unstable. I don't think they've stabilized it yet. Um, and some of their products, um, a lot of the optimization is about getting a product to work well for a variety of skin types. And um, they haven't really done that 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 much, so which is how they've kept their products so budget friendly. Um, so sometimes their products are like um, they work really well for some people, and then a whole bunch of people break out from them. So it can be a bit of a crapshoot. You are sort of running that risk. But um, if their products work for you, then that's amazing because then you've got like a five dollar product or a ten dollar product that works um, almost as well as something that might be two hundred dollars. Um, yeah, so. There is always like a sort of risk reward thing with these super budget um, brands. Um, with the ones that are, um, I guess, still cheap, but still have lots of clinical backing behind them, you're probably looking at um, brands from multinational companies that can have that economy of scale. Um, so this is brands like CeraVe, um, Cetaphil, um, QV even. Um, QV is actually a really good one because they're Australian and they have... Um, they're a pharma brand, so they can do a lot of this clinical research um, a lot more easily than a cosmetic brand. Um, so, yeah, these ones I think are really good for just staple products, things like moisturizer, sunscreen, cleanser, um, giant tubs of body cleanser that are um, going to work well, um, are going to be good for sensitive skin and, yeah, super budget friendly. Um, as you go up, um, if you're going for more expensive products, I would be looking for clinical evidence um, of their specific formulations working on, like working, basically. Um, so, yeah, I think last time we talked about cosmetics versus drugs, which is just the issue where cosmetic products, even if they work well, they're not meant to tell you that they work well in like a physiological way. Like they can't say it reduces wrinkles. Um, they are meant to say it reduces the appearance of wrinkles. Mm -hmm. Even if they reduce wrinkles, like even if they make the wrinkles look smaller by reducing the depth of wrinkles by increasing collagen, they're not meant to say that unless they want to get slapped with a fine. Um, so, yeah, it's always a bit of a reading between the lines. So, in general, what, what I would look for before buying an expensive product would be um, whether it contains an ingredient that should work and whether or not they have clinical evidence that their specific formula works. So this is something like um, 
like reliable looking before and afters where the lighting hasn't changed a lot. Um, if they have some sort of um, like clinical trial of like 20, 20 people with a somewhat objective measure. So something like um, 50% or like 90% of subjects had um, reduced appearance of wrinkles after four weeks as assessed by an expert grader or something like that. In nutrition, sometimes um, there are groups of people that are kind of underrepresented in studies. For example, a lot of women of childbearing age are you know, are not or are excluded from from various trials. For you know, there are some some good reasons for that, but it it does mean that um, a lot of research you kind of have to just take a leap or extrapolate and presume that it's also those findings. Um, stand for that population as well. In the research in the cosmetic area, um, tell me about the typical participants. Are they including people, for example, um, a different race and a lot of different ages? And is it, are there males within these studies as well? Or is there a kind of typical sort of avatar that that clinical studies are looking at in this space? A lot of the clinical studies are on anti-aging because it is like the biggest um, the biggest sector, I guess, in, um, in cosmetic skincare. And so most of those studies are done on um, Caucasian women between 40 and 60. So yeah, that is going to be one of the caveats with um, anti-aging products. With acne trials, um, that tends to be a mix, but it's generally people under 30. Um, a lot of the time it is um, teenagers. Um, with um, studies in general, I think this is just across all of medicine, it's just um, black people tend to be underrepresented. So with pigmentation trials, most of those are with a, um, East Asian women, um, like people like me, like Chinese, Japanese, Korean. Um, yeah, so it is actually quite hard to find trials on black people, even with sunscreen. Um, sunscreen has to be tested on people with light skin because otherwise you can't see that reddening effect. So even if it's not like a, um, sometimes it is just a practical issue, but that does lead to um, to systematic um, biases in the data. So yeah, there is a bit of extrapolation required. Um, a lot of the time, though, the um, things that work well for like reducing wrinkles in an older population usually they also work well in a younger population. The only, I guess the biggest difference is that you would probably see a bigger difference if you're starting from like a more severe baseline, mm -hmm. which you would be with an older group. Sure. So that gets me wondering sort of if we're thinking about preserving collagen and elastin, renewing cells. So you've mentioned vitamin C, vitamin A, you've mentioned retinol. Um, is this something that that people are considering when they are, reach that age of 30 and collagen production goes down and, and that's when you're sort of introducing it into your skincare regime if you want, if that's something that is important to you and you want to pursue, or is it something that, you know, if someone's listening now and they're in their early 20s, are they getting on the front foot and starting that early? So I think with prevention, with using sunscreens, um, maybe antioxidants, that they tend to be in tons of products anyway. I think that tends to be good when you're younger because it is prevention. The earlier you start, the better. Um, so yeah, I think with sunscreen, you can definitely start on that in your 20s. With some of the other products like um, retinol derivatives, like vitamin A, those actually have other effects as well. Most skincare ingredients have effects other than like, they have kind of more general effects. So retinol is actually a um, treatment for acne as well, as well as pigment, as well as wrinkles. It kind of just like does everything. And so, yeah, a lot of people do start on that in their 20s because of other reasons. Um, in terms of preventative, I think there isn't really any sort of like lower bound in terms of when you can start on vitamin A. Um, so, yeah, you can start it in, on it in your 20s. Um, there is this myth on the internet, which is... Um, you can run out of skin. Um, so you renew your skin too much and then you've made your cells to buy too much. And then they like the telomeres get shorter and then you just stop having cells. Um, this doesn't happen because your skin actually has adult stem cells in it. Um, and these stem cells, their telomeres don't shorten with more division. So yeah, there isn't any sort of concern with, um, yeah, running out of skin because you started on skincare too young. Right. So yeah, in your twenties, um, you can start on retinol if you want. 
there does seem to be some sort of preventative effect. Um, but at the same time, in your 20s, you probably have a more limited budget. And so I think that is also a big consideration. Mm. Like, are you, um, are you affecting other parts of your life because you're too concerned about wrinkles? Mm. Um, and I think that is a question that a lot of people should be asking themselves because a lot of marketing has made us feel so paranoid, um, especially if you're female, about um, looking like you're aging. Um, so, yeah, in your 20s, I would say sunscreen, maybe antioxidants. Um, if you have acne, you maybe target that. Wrinkles, you probably don't have to worry too much about. In your 30s, if you are starting to see wrinkles, um, then now would be a perfect time to introduce the retinol, um, maybe a vitamin C product as well, and keep on with the sunscreen. As you get older, um, if you start younger with these products, you should see, um, I guess, compounding effects as you get older. Like you will probably have much nicer skin at 40. Um, but if you're starting when you're a bit older and you already have deeper wrinkles, um, I think maybe start on these sorts of same products as well, like sunscreen, retinol, vitamin C, um, chemical exfoliants. But then um, if that's not doing that much, it might be time to look at going to um, a cosmetic dermatologist and they can start using products or treatments that are actually going to go deeper than what skincare can do. So this is things like um, laser treatments, which can target collagen deeper in the skin and um, kind of cause like a, um, a wounding effect, a controlled wounding effect that can um, stimulate the collagen to, um, to start growing. Um, oh, one thing you mentioned that I forgot to address earlier was ingestible collagen. Um, so there is some evidence that um, collagen supplements can work to make you produce more collagen. Um, so collagen supplements generally tend to have hydrolyzed collagen, which is collagen broken up into small amino acid chains. Um, so they have like two, three, four, um, some length of um, broken up collagen. And it looks like um, these can be absorbed into your blood and then travel to your skin and signal for your skin to produce more collagen. Um, the caveat is a lot of these um, studies are done by supplement companies. Um, so there's a bit of bias there. Um, some of them aren't, some of them, or some of them are actually like the supplement company in collaboration with um, a university. So that should be a bit more reliable. But I would say that so far the evidence looks like they could work. How do you think they compare to say retinol and some of these other ingredients that, that you were speaking of that can increase collagen production? Um, I would say um, the biggest issue is probably price. Um, so collagen supplements, I think most of the time they you end up spending about two one or two dollars a day um, on the collagen supplements, whereas with something like retinol or tretinoin, it is a lot cheaper and sunscreen as well. Um, so I think I would probably start with the skincare things, and then if you want more, then and if you have the budget, then maybe look at ingestible collagen. And again, because there's so many different ways of chopping up the collagen, um, I would go with something that has clinical studies behind it. Um, and also from a reputable brand, because a lot of supplements have, um, I believe in collagen supplements, sometimes there's heavy metal contamination. And so, yeah, again, it's such an unregulated marketplace. I would definitely look for something reputable. Mm -hmm. Okay. So what about, where does um, ingredients like hyaluronic acid, which also gets a lot of airtime, so we haven't spoken about that one yet. Where does that come into the picture here? Is that for a, a kind of, would you take that for a different reason other than, than aging? Um, I'm not sure about ingesting, but with hyaluronic acid in skincare products, um, that is mostly a humectant. So it's an ingredient that holds onto water in your skin and keeps it more hydrated. Um, with wrinkles, a lot of wrinkling is actually from dehydrated skin. Um, as your skin gets older, it gets less able to hold onto its own water because of that um, barrier problem where the barrier starts, um, those dead skin cells on the surface, they start... Um, not functioning as well as they should. Sometimes they um, shed in chunks rather than as like a consistent layer. And so you end up with more permeable skin. Um, a lot of people, like when they get older, their skin gets more easily irritated by things, especially after menopause. 
Um, so yeah, the hyaluronic acid is good for hydrating. And even in a lot of trials, um, there is one sneaky thing that some companies do in their clinical trials, which is um, instead of comparing their product with like a, um, an inactive cream, they actually compare their product to um, skin that hasn't got any moisturizer on it just to give a bigger effect. And that's because, yeah, just moisturizing your skin can kind of add water, plump up your skin a bit, and then make your fine lines less shallow. Sorry. Yes. Less deep. <laughs> um, so yeah, hyaluronic acid can plump up your skin in that temporary way. Um, but it's, it's a good humectant. Um, if it works for you, that's good. Um, but there are actually cheaper options. So one of the ones is glycerin, which is a super cheap ingredient. And that's also been found to go through special pores in your skin called aquaporins and hydrate at a deeper level. Um, so yeah, you don't have to get hyaluronic acid, um, but if you feel like your skin is quite dry, maybe look for hyaluronic acid or glycerin. Mm -hmm. You mentioned chemical exfoliants. Mm. Talk to me about exfoliation. Um, so clearly there's an important place for that within the, the sort of well-aging category. What do we, when you say chemical exfoliants, uh, what, what does that mean? What are we looking for on an exfoliant product and how frequently would someone be using that if they're interested in sort of cell renewal and trying to reduce fine lines and wrinkles and perhaps increase collagen? Yeah, so exfoliation is basically um, helping that dead layer of skin cells shed in a more even way. So yeah, when your skin gets older, um, and also in different situations as well, your skin cells might uh, your skin cells might not shed as evenly. And also, like there are some um, climatic um, influences as well. So if it's too dry, your skin doesn't shed properly. Um, so exfoliation is just a way of trying to get that physiological process to work better and just, yeah, give it a bit of a, give it a bit of a shove. Um, so there's physical exfoliants, which I think are probably more commonly known, things like scrubs, um, any scrubbing washcloths, that sort of thing, just physically um, slowing off that dead skin cell layer. Um, chemical exfoliants are ingredients that can um, dissolve um, dissolve the joints between the dead skin cells um, and help them come off in a more even layer. Um, so this is ingredients like glycolic acid, lactic acid, salicylic acid, um, mandelic acid. Those are probably the top four. Also, urea does this as well. And yeah, so this helps the skin cells shed in a more even layer. Um, on top of that, the acids can also um, stimulate your cells um, to uh, proliferate faster. So it will actually do stuff um, below the surface other than just shedding the skin cells. Um, on top of this, um, it isn't just for aging. Um, there's also evidence that this helps with acne as well. Um, so yeah, just having the dead skin cells come off more easily means that you have less dead skin cells to clog the pores um, and cause um, like mini, mini blockages that turn into those big um, pimples. Um, with chemical exfoliants, um, the main problem, I guess, not really a problem, something to watch out for is that um, some of them, the alpha hydroxy acids, glycolic acid and lactic acid, can make your skin more sensitive to the sun. And so if you're using glycolic acid, trying to like be, you have that anti-aging effect, you can actually make your skin more sun sensitive and then end up with worse skin than you started with. So yeah, make sure you're wearing a sunscreen um, during the day when you're using any sort of exfoliant, which you should have been anyway. <laughs> so um, just uh, a silly question perhaps here, but my experience in using exfoliants is some of them are quite abrasive. Like you literally feel the um, exfoliation sort of happening. And, and um, I'm assuming that those, the abrasive element is what's actually helping clear those dead skin cells from the, the skin as you're scrubbing. Um, so a chemical exfoliant, you're not going to feel that abrasiveness. Is it, is it a different kind of user experience? Yeah, so generally these are going to be leave-on products. It's like a watery sort of liquid that you spread over your skin. Sometimes you'll feel a bit of stinging because a lot of them are at a low pH. Um, and also, I mean, it's acid. So you might feel a bit of stinging, um, but the sting doesn't necessarily mean that it's working. So don't purposely look for the sting. There are lots of these that work really well without any sort of like immediate feeling. And then over the next maybe week, um, 
few days, you should be seeing a difference in your skin. Like your skin should end up being a bit smoother, um, being kind of more even. Um, it also helps fade pigment as well if you have any sort of uneven pigment. And, yeah, you should end up with sort of like that, um, I guess, colloquial glowing skin. Mm. So frequency-wise, is that something that you do once a week? Is there Can you damage your skin if you use a chemical exfoliant too frequently or you leave it on for too long? Yeah, so um, chemical exfoliants, they come in many, many different strengths. Um, and so I would probably recommend just following the instructions. Um, if you're new to them, maybe just start with once a week and then increase in frequency. You can increase up to probably once a day, but I think with most people, you probably only need it two or three times a week. Um, yeah, um, they're actually the same products that a lot of um, cosmetic clinics use as peels. Um, so they're just usually in a high concentration. And then with those ones, you will actually get like skin peeling off over the next few days. And so, yeah, you can damage your skin. You can get rid of too many layers of dead skin cells because they are meant to be there. They have a function, which is to protect your skin from the environment. And so if you've over exfoliated, you'll probably feel like stinging. You'll probably have um, products that didn't used to sting start making your skin hurt. And that's a good sign that you should probably exfoliate less because you are damaging that barrier. We mentioned the microbiome earlier, um, skin microbiome. So in, for example, products like this, chemical exfoliants, ha, have researchers looked at how that could impact the actual the microbiome on the skin and, and the effect that that could have? I don't think they specifically looked at that, but there is um, research on the pH of skin and how that affects the microbiome. Um, so some people have actually started using chemical exfoliants as deodorants because, um, yeah, if you put it on your armpits, you acidify your armpits and that reduces the amount of the bacteria that turns your sweat chemicals into BO molecules. Um, so that seems to be having some sort of microbiome impact. So um, yeah, the issue with microbiome research, and I think it's pretty similar in nutrition, is that a lot of the research is sort of in its infancy. And so we can't really say like preserving your microbiome is necessarily a good or a bad thing. Mm -hmm. It just seems to be, I think, like having a diverse microbiome is good, but then if you have like specific, um, like if you have too much of a specific microbe on your skin, then that actually leads to some of the disorders. So um, lots of disorders have been linked to imbalances, like acne is linked to proliferation of, I believe it's um, a bacteria called C. acnes. And I think it's only like one of the strains of that. Um, with things like um, eczema, psoriasis, there's, there's a lot. Um, rosacea even, it's to do with some of the microbes on your skin. And so I think um, with microbiome, I would probably just not even look at the word microbiome and just look for something that works. So for example, a lot of um, the products that we already use on our skin that we know are well-established treatments do act on the microbiome. Um, benzoyl peroxide, for example, it just kind of like blasts a whole bunch of bacteria away and that seems to help with acne. Mm -hmm. um, or we know that that helps with acne and supposedly it's because it's changing the microbiome to one that is less acnogenic. Mm -hmm. So yeah, I would just stick with claims like clinical results rather than trying to think too hard about microbiome. Okay. So for someone that's 30 plus, sunscreen is sort of the the foundation and high SPF. We spoke about that last episode. And then there's the antioxidants, vitamin C, vitamin E, there's uh, retinol. And now we're speaking about the chemical exfoliation. Is there anything else that we've kind of missed where there is good clinical evidence for someone who's interested in sort of healthy aging? Um, I think the one that is kind of um, good um, is niacinamide. Um, niacinamide is vitamin B3. And this one is less, I guess, about anti-aging. It is an antioxidant. Um, it does seem to have effects on pigments, pigment as well. But I think the main thing is that it's actually good for um, helping restore the skin barrier. So it's really good for sensitive skin. And it's actually quite cool because it's one of the few skincare ingredients that has a lot of evidence behind it. Um, but it doesn't irritate your skin. And so it's just, yeah, a nice addition. Um, it was actually the active ingredient in um, in Fair and Lovely, I think it's called. Um, you know, those, um, those creams that are sold in India that are associated with those like really dodgy advertisements about how like, if you lighten your skin, you, your, your mum will finally love you. Um, that sort of 
questionable stuff. But yeah, that is actually has been found to even out pigment. I don't know if it'll bleach your skin really by itself, but it does even out uneven pigmentation, which is a big concern for lots of um, lots of um, women with pigmented skin, especially. Um, and yeah, a lot of that research was actually done by Procter and Gamble, and yeah very nice very nicely and very rarely um it's very unusual in skincare they actually um published that in peer-reviewed journals and shared their research mm -hmm. so yeah that is um one of the most evidence-backed ingredients that we haven't quite covered yet and i would probably recommend that to anyone of any age um, but especially if you have sensitive skin mm -hmm. okay very good what about overrated ingredients for for aging, are there any ingredients out there that um, there's there's great marketing for and a lot of noise, but really not a lot of clinical evidence or not as much evidence as the ones that we've gone through? There are so many. Um, I feel like I could probably go for days on this, but I think the most popular one at the moment is bacuchiol. Um, this has been marketed as um, an alternative to retinol. Um, and this was based on like some clinical studies where they found that it reduced wrinkles and signs of aging, that sort of thing. Um, but the thing is like lots of things reduce wrinkles and signs of aging um, with much better evidence like chemical exfoliants. Um, and they've never really been marketed as an alternative to retinol. Um, and it looks like it works on completely different biological pathways. So, um, yeah, it's very questionable how it's an alternative to retinol, but it has caught on a lot with marketing. Um, it is a plant extract, which I think always appeals to that sort of clean crowd, even though vitamin A is perfectly natural. Um, for some reason, people believe that it's toxic or whatever. Um, and yeah, it's just been really overblown. I mean, I think it is a promising ingredient. It's just really not what it's cracked up to be because the evidence base, the reason we love retinol and vitamin A derivatives so much and why everyone goes on about them is because their evidence base is so large. But this has like, I think, one or two papers by the companies selling it. So yeah, I would probably not try to use it as an alternative, maybe as an addition. There are some products that have both of them in it, which I think is a good approach. Um, but yeah, there's tons of ingredients. What was that there's probably again? um Bacuchiol. Um B A K U C H I O L. Okay. Um yeah, but yeah, there's tons and tons of ingredients that have tons of hype and not much behind them and they're coming out every day. So yeah, just it's a very um, tricky situation for the consumer. Right. Well, I guess the easiest process is to focus on the ones where there is clinical evidence uh, and just be aware that there'll be a lot of claims about other things and and perhaps not as much evidence uh, yet. Anyway, what about natural plant-derived compounds like you 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 see your yoba or aloe vera or willow bark, you know, a bunch of these different kind of ingredients that you see often in like serums, um, is there any evidence for 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 these kind of natural plant derived compounds? Um, there is evidence for some of them. Um, one of the ones that's really popular right now is Centella asiatica extract. This has um, properties with um, skin barrier repair. Um, the main issue with plant extracts is that there's so much variation. It's like what is actually in the plant extract in terms of the chemical substances inside it. It depends on so much. It depends on like when it was harvested, how that um, extract was extracted, where it's grown, um, what time of year it was harvested, um, whether they're using um, like, I don't know, even like different ripenesses of the fruit or um, whether the leaves are like exposed to more or less sun. So there's just so much variation that it's always a bit hard to say with just plant extracts. So a lot of the time with those, um, it's the active ingredients that get extracted and put into the products. And I feel like that's a more reliable method. So with Centella Asiatica, there's four different ingredients in it. Um, one of them is called madecasticide. <laughs> um, and so that one is sometimes used as a separate ingredient. With licorice, um, licorice extract can fade pigment. Um, but a lot of the time, again, it's like the glycerizic acid, I think it's called. It's, it starts with G and has a whole bunch of Zs. But sometimes that 
um, is actually used as the um, as the ingredient in a product. Mm -hmm. So I would probably go for those over the extracts, unless again there is clinical evidence for that overall formula, or that extract is actually standardized and it'll say on the marketing somewhere. Because if it is standardized, they will probably try to show it off. Mm -hmm. Do you know off the top of your head? And I might be putting you on the spot here. Any any brands that are using those kind of plant compounds that you feel are, are doing a good job? Um, La Roche Posay has a product that's super popular called the Cicaplast Balm, and that has Centella Asiatica in it. Um, they were using the specific extract, like the specific um, chemical, but then I think in their newest formulation, they switched to the plant extract. And I feel like that might just be for marketing purposes. So I'm a bit disappointed in that, but it is a very good product um, and it's it seems to work really well for a lot of people. Um, with the licorice extract, I haven't really seen any products on the market specifically. Um, nothing really comes to mind for that. So let's dive a little deeper into acne. You mentioned benzoyl peroxide earlier, chemical exfoliations, but where do we sort of begin with the the evidence looking at acne and, and skincare? Um, what do we understand about active ingredients or if someone's listening now and they're struggling with acne, what kind of direction would you give them that would lead them to perhaps finding the most effective products that are that are going to help them the best with acne? I think with acne, um, there are a lot of over-the-counter options. Um, the ones that are recommended in Australia and are actually approved in Australia, um, benzoyl peroxide is probably the main one. Benzoyl peroxide comes in lots of different forms. The main ones are like leave-on creams as well as um, cleansers. So I would probably start with a cleanser just because it's a bit more practical. So it doesn't fade um, pillowcases and towels as much. Um, there's also um, salicylic acid, which is um, not technically a drug in Australia, I believe. Yeah, it's not a drug, but it is in the US for acne um, and in a lot of other places too. So I would probably also look for a leave-on salicylic acid product, probably at about 2% concentration. Um, so that's a good chemical exfoliant that um, helps those um, skin cells shed and keeps the pores clear. Um, so the things that contribute to acne, there's four main factors. One of them is um, basically pore clogging. Um, then there's also the acne bacteria. Um, there's also um, hyper uh, yeah, there's um, hyperkeratinization, which is um, too much skin cells, like just yeah, clogging. Um, actually, no, I think those two are the same. Um, there's oil production, and um, there's also inflammation. So things that target these will reduce acne. And so yeah, the um, the salicylic acid will tackle the skin cells, too many skin cells clogging up pores, and the benzoyl peroxide targets that as well as kills the acne bacteria. Um, oh yeah, salicylic acid is also anti-inflammatory. And so, yeah, you can sort of see the things that um, tend to be first options for acne, that tends to be um, things that target multiple pathways in acne um, formation. So yeah, those will be the first two. Um, there is also um, vitamin A derivatives, like I said, um, there are um, vitamin A derivatives that can reduce acne. Um, the ones that are for acne tend to be prescription only in Australia. Um, so you might want to go see um, a dermatologist or even a GP. Um, GPs can prescribe these. Um, <clears throat> I think if your skin is, um, if your acne is really bad, like if it's leaving a lot of scarring, if it's causing you a lot of psychological distress, and you've tried a few of the options on the market and none of it's really helping, then I would highly recommend going to see a doctor or a dermatologist and they can give you one of these stronger options that will um, hopefully yeah, help you tackle your acne and maybe also identify if there's like some other contributor like PCOS. Mm -hmm. is, the, is the risk with some of these products that it could lead to sort of drying and flaking of the skin, is that a concern at all with, with using benzoyl peroxide for example and some of those other acids um and is that is there is there a way to kind of prevent that or is that something that in this instance you're not really worried about um yeah so if your skin is really dry and flaking that can actually increase inflammation which can make your acne worse so yeah it's a good idea to have like a moisturizer as well some sort of light moisturizer like from CeraVe, Cetaphil, QV those have really nice light bland moisturizers you can use um, 
But in terms of um, whether or not your these um, active ingredients will cause that, with cleansers, it tends to be a lot more rare um, than with the leave-on benzoyl peroxide products. And a lot of salicylic acid products on the market now are formulated to be a lot more hydrating. And so the risk is a bit lower. Mm-hmm. But yeah, if you are experiencing tight skin, then go for a moisturizer too. Okay. And what about spot treatment? Say someone has a pimple, they want to get rid of it. They want it to reduce in size. Um, I've always heard things like tea tree oil. I'm not sure if that's an old wife's tale or not, but um, you can tell me. But are there, are, there, are there certain products or ingredients that are very helpful in the acute kind of situation to help sort of manage a, a sort of flare up, so to speak? Yeah, so benzoyl peroxide and salicylic acid will both work for that um, as a spot treatment. Tea tree oil is an interesting one. Um, So tea tree oil has been um, used in a clinical trial against benzoyl peroxide. I believe it was diluted to 5%. And they found that it worked as well as benzoyl peroxide with less irritation, but it is just one study. Um, And because there is all this variation with tea tree oil, um, since it is a natural extract, um, yeah, it's a bit questionable whether the set like or work the same for everyone with every product so yeah it is definitely an option that you could try um but i would probably go with the more um i guess the more standardized versions first like benzoyl peroxide okay and if someone's struggling with oiliness are these the same types of ingredients that you'd be recommending for them or if they're going and buying for example a moisturizer they have oily skin what are what are they looking for So with oily skin, um, one of the biggest issues is that it is pretty internally controlled. Um, There's very few things you can use topically on your skin that will reduce oiliness. Um, So one of the main treatments for it is actually um, oral contraceptives. Um, And this also is a treatment for acne because that oil contributes to the acne. Um, But yeah, apart from like these sorts of drugs, generally you won't get prescribed this for oiliness because it's not really a big enough problem to warrant like pharmaceutical intervention. So it's really like a side effect if you had something else that you were prescribed that for. Um, In terms of um, things that are topical, with oily skin, one of the things that um, can help the oil feel less, like less of an issue, um, even though it doesn't really reduce the oil, is actually hydrating your skin. So A lot of the time with oily skin, with people like me, um, we're just kind of brought up to think that we just need to dry out our skin. Um, But the thing is, if your skin is really dry, um, it can actually get your skin to um, release more oil onto the surface. Um, There are these little packets of oil within your um, top layers of skin um, that get triggered to, um, to open up when your skin hydration level is low. And so if you look for a cream that has um, a lot of humectants in it, so glycerin, um, hyaluronic acid, that sort of thing, that can um, increase the water content of your skin, that can make the oil a lot less, a lot more manageable. Um, So I would actually look into that, like check if your skin is actually like missing water um, and it feels oily because of that. Um, There are also um, products that will temporarily soak up the oil like clay masks um, and even face powder. So yeah, those are all going to help. Okay, great. Okay. So I want to move on to hair care, but is there anything that we've we've missed or you'd like to expand on with regards to well-aging, acne, sensitive skin or oiliness um, before we do move on? Um, not really, just to reiterate, sometimes, um, some of these problems are caused by products that you're using that aren't right for your skin. So before you start piling on even more products, maybe like, um, stop using your products and see if your breakouts are getting better. If your skin is getting less sensitive before you try to find a solution outside. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, let's, let's change gears and move over to hair care. Um, from a solutions point of view, what are, what are people looking for and what are brands kind of catering for here? Um, off the top of my head, I, I hear um, claims about bonds and um, split ends, um, hair thinning. Give us a bit of the kind of lay of the land when it comes to hair care. Hair care is actually really tricky to talk about because um, so much hair care research is just hidden and locked up inside hair care companies. Um, there's very few like 
there's basically no incentive to publish peer-reviewed research on hair care. Um, and yeah, so a lot of it is just very secretive. Um, with hair care, it's also more complex because um, I guess it's more and less complex. So hair is dead, which means you don't have to think too much about like biological stuff when it comes to hair care, except for things like growing more hair, which is like within the living part, but with things like long hair, less split ends, it's not really about biology. Um, yeah, but the way that hair care products are made, a lot of the time, if you have exactly the same ingredients, having different proportions will give a very different result. So with something like a shampoo, the core ingredients are always the same. It's like water, bunch of surfactants, and then stuff to keep the shampoo preserved and stable and like the right thickness. With conditioners, it is generally water, um, some sort of um, cationic surfactant, and then a fatty alcohol, and then a bunch of other ingredients. And so, yeah, it's really the proportions. Um, and you can't see that as a consumer. So a lot of the time it is about trial and error, trying out different products on your hair and seeing how your hair um, interacts. Um, in terms of ingredients, so those are the standard ones. With, there are some add-ins and there are some special, I guess, active ingredients that will change, um, that will do special things to your hair. So with split ends, um, I would say looking, you should probably be looking for a really intense conditioner. Um, you can't really repair split ends. There are a couple of products on the market, but I don't think they work that well. Um, that can sort of like literally like sew the split end back together. It's pretty cool, um, but I don't think they work that well. So I think it's really about um, being using um, a conditioner with some special ingredients. So silicones tend to get a bad rap, but they're actually really good for coating the hair um, and giving it that sort of protective shield. So silicones are good. There are some special functionalized silicones um, like amodimethicone, which can um, which don't weigh down hair. So don't be scared of silicones just because you've heard they um, make your hair greasy or coat it in an inactive shield. That is a good thing. And there's tons of different products on the market with very different effects. Um, and a lot of it is actually about um, handling of hair. So because hair is dead, like from the moment it leaves your scalp, it can only get worse. Um, it's only going to get more damaged. It will never really get like healthier. So um, one of the things is really just avoiding doing too much with your hair, having too much like physical, um, I guess, um, friction with your hair when it's wet. When it's wet, hair swells up and the um, cuticles tend to stick up more. The cuticles are like those, um, they're scales on your hair that should be lying flat and they're protective. But when your hair is wet, they stick up and then they can break off. And so your hair loses some of that protection. So um, yeah, be really careful when combing your hair when wet, when brushing your hair when wet. Um, don't get a towel and just like rub your hair to try to dry it, like try to squeeze it, um, treat it gently. Mm -hmm. In terms of heat, um, too much heat can also break down your hair. Um, it can cause a lot of damage. And so, um, yeah, with heating, be really careful with heat with heat styling, um, use a heat protectant. So there are lots of products that um, can form a layer on top of the hair and spread out the heat more. Um, and that means you get less like hot spots on your hair when you're using a hair straightener or um, a hair dryer. Um, in terms of hair drying, there is actually a study that found that drying your hair on low heat was actually better for it than letting it air dry just because your hair wasn't in that wet, fragile state for quite as long. So, yeah, um, if you are drying your hair with a hairdryer, just don't blast it too hot. Interesting. What about the frequency of, of shampoo and conditioner? Um, I seem to have – I've never really had a routine. I kind of just make it up. But um, I go off my gut feel, which is probably the wrong way of doing it. What is it something that we're doing daily, every second day, once a week – what is there any evidence to to sort of suggest what is the the best in terms of helping maintain healthy strong hair? Um, I think in general, um, there isn't really like a strict guideline, and going by your gut feel is actually not a bad option at all. So um, a lot of the time with shampoo, it is about how often you need to get rid of the gunk on your scalp. Um, so yeah, in terms of frequency. 
have again having your hair wet makes it more fragile and so you are kind of aiming to have your hair wet as few times as possible um but in reality a lot of people um their scalps do need to be cleaned more frequently and so daily shampooing can be a better idea um there's also some um there's also some evidence that if your hair like your scalp is not clean that often if you get a lot of buildup that can actually cause hair loss um so yeah overall yeah gut feel is probably the way to go okay. and yeah so in terms of that sort of quote unquote gunk on the scalp that could contribute to hair loss um is that something that you can avoid through regular shampoo and do you need to sort of shampoo a particular way for that to to occur in terms of sort of spending time massaging your scalp or do you need another product similar to we were talking about chemical exfoliants for the face do you need some form of a abrasive scrub or you know what what is going to be best for helping promote a healthy scalp um the I mean, we've been using shampoo for like decades and it seems to be fine for most people. There are a bunch of new products on the market that are like trying to, it's called the skinification of hair. So there's just, I feel like it is really the beauty industry trying to find more types of products to sell to people, um, but they do exist. There are like chemical exfoliants, scrub, um, scalp scrubs. There are like um, silicone brushes for like working the shampoo into your hair a bit better. And yeah, if you've always had issues with your scalp, then maybe trying these out would be good. But I don't think everyone needs them. Shampoo should be enough for most people. And um, one thing you could try if you do have longer hair and you are finding a lot of buildup is not getting your conditioner anywhere near your scalp. So conditioner doesn't really have a purpose for your scalp. The hair up the top is already quite well conditioned. And in modern shampoos, there are actually ingredients that will coat the hair and have a like form of protective coating. So chances are you don't need extra conditioning up here. So if you um, only put your conditioner below the ears, um, then that can reduce some of that buildup. Mm -hmm. Okay. And on hair loss, if someone's experiencing that, so are there any particular ingredients in shampoos and conditioners that they should be looking out for that would differentiate a sort of regular shampoo and conditioner versus one that is particularly effective for hair loss? Um, so there are actually um, pharmaceutical products that you can use for hair loss. Um, so minoxidil, for example, um, and these are generally, I believe, prescription only in Australia. So you can go to the doctor and get um, something for that. Um, in terms of things that cause hair loss or um, can encourage hair growth, it's all a very murky sort of market with um, encouraging hair growth because that is technically another drug claim that cosmetics aren't meant to make. Um, and I don't think there's really anything that's really been proven to work aside from those drugs. Um, for hair loss, I would probably look out for things that you are allergic to. Um, so for example, um, MI and MCI, I think they tend to be kind of um, going under the radar as causes of hair loss because, yeah, if you are allergic, you are getting your scalp inflamed and that will probably not be good for your hair follicles. Okay. What about ingredients that we may maybe don't want to see in a hair care product? I think I mentioned earlier, you put a video up yesterday and I believe that lady was talking about dry shampoo and it was benzenes were the focus of, of that particular claim. Um, a benzene is just another one of these ingredients where you're quite comfortable with their inclusion at the, at the sort of input level or dose uh, exposure level that someone would be getting through regular, regular use of those products. So with benzene, that was a trace contaminant in the um, dry shampoo. Um, with the amounts that were found in it, um, they shouldn't be a big issue. So from previous contamination issues with the same contaminating propellant, um, so it's actually the propellant in the dry shampoo, the stuff pushing um, the product out that seemed to have the contamination. Um, it shouldn't be a big issue. Um, the amount should be less than breathing for half a day in the city. Um, 
But I think it is a good idea to get it out. Uh, but the problem is, yeah, you can't really avoid it by looking for it in an ingredients list because it is a contaminant. Mm -hmm. The other ingredients that she mentioned were um, butane, propane, and isobutane. And these are actually the propellant gases that are pushing um, the product out. And those are fine. They are gases, so they're not going to end up really on your hair. They're not going to be touching your scalp for very long, even if they do get pushed into there. Um, and they're very, very safe. So they are actually just the same thing as like um, natural gas in your barbecue stove, in your um, in your cigarette lighters. Um, and yeah, they don't really have any um, any real impact except unless, of course, they light on fire, um, which is not good. Um, or if you breathe in a lot and you end up yeah, not getting enough oxygen. So I think um, with dry shampoo, I think the biggest risk, honestly, is again, that scalp buildup. There are reports of people who have been using too much dry shampoo and they've been getting hair loss because um, dry shampoo is just powder that you add to your scalp to soak up oil. Um, so unlike a proper shampoo, you're not actually getting rid of residue from your scalp. You're just adding to it. Um, so yeah, I would probably try to just reduce use of dry shampoo um, just for that reason, gotcha. and try to use regular shampoo. Mm -hmm. Okay. Very interesting. And I guess as well, I know you're saying the propellants are not an issue, but dry shampoo also comes in a kind of form where you just sort of tap it onto your hair as well, right? Yeah, I would probably prefer to use that. And I personally use that over the um, propellant version. Okay. Well, speaking of propellants, that kind of brings us to deodorants, which is the last thing that I wanted to talk to you about today. So I'm assuming that you have the same sort of view with regards to aerosol deodorants and butane, some of these these different kind of propellant ingredients. Yeah, I guess the only other thing I would say is I personally try not to use too many spray products. Um, and that's because... Um, that kind of just opens you up to another avenue of um, of exposure to whatever's in your um, your products. Most of the time, it is again, it is generally quite safe, um, but it does just sort of increase the risk, and it's kind of unnecessary. I think, um, yeah, just because as as well as being on your skin, you are also inhaling it, and your lungs tend to be more sensitive. So, if you are using them, use them in a well ventilated area. Mm -hmm. Okay, and what about aluminium? or aluminum um, that they might say in the States is this often comes up and and I think there's a, a sort of, um, there's some rhetoric out there that this is harmful and you should avoid this. Um, are, we, are we best off choosing a deodorant that is free of aluminium? Um, so aluminium is an antiperspirant. Um, so the way it works is it reacts with um, sweat, it reacts with water and forms plugs in your sweat glands um, just at the surface and that blocks you from sweating. Um, so, I mean, it sounds kind of bad and I think this is the sort of marketing that um, brands tend to use with clean beauty, like blocking sweating is not natural. Um, but with sweat, it's like the main function of sweat is really for cooling. It isn't for detoxifying. You're not really um, detoxifying much through sweat. And if you're using deodorant, you aren't using it all over your body. So you have tons of other places where you can sweat out. Um, like I think it's like the 2% of things that you are excreting through sweat. Um, so yeah, the that's probably the main sort of um, clean beauty message about antiperspirants. The other message is that aluminium is toxic, which um, it is via some exposures, but with um, putting it on your skin, it doesn't absorb through skin very well. And it looks like the exposure that you get naturally through food because aluminium is in like vegetables because it comes from the soil. Um, that exposure is way higher than what you would get through an antiperspirant. Now, um, with um, whether or not you should be using it, it really depends on whether or not you need to have antiperspirant, like whether or not you are you want to reduce the sweat. Um, if you don't care how much you sweat um, and you just care about the smell, then you're probably looking for a deodorant and you don't need aluminium. Um, you just want something that changes the smell. But if you do want to block the sweating, then you are going to have to use something with aluminium because there are pretty much there's pretty much nothing else that does that. Your main alternative is probably Botox injections um, that can, yeah, stop the sweating. A lot of people get them in their hands because 
yeah, if you have really sweaty hands, you probably don't want to be just using um, antiperspirant on your hands. Um, yeah, so yeah, it's it's really not that high a risk. Um, it's been reevaluated many, many times in terms of safety, and yeah, it always comes up as very, very safe. So, what do you? How do you feel about natural deodorants? I've I've used a few before, and personally speaking, I haven't tried them all, but I just haven't found them to be as effective. Um, do you have a kind of view on the natural deodorants that that exist? Yeah. So most natural deodorants, they are just fragrances. They are just like a blend of essential oils that could cover up the smell of BO. And that's probably why they haven't been that effective. Um, if you do sweat a lot, the way that BO works is that um, your sweat contains some nutrients in it that bacteria can um can metabolize and turn into that BO smell. And so that's why antiperspirant deodorants work so much better because they block, um, they cover up the smell, plus they also block the um, the ingredients that make the BO from coming out in the first place. Um, so yeah, natural deodorants, because they generally don't have the aluminium, they aren't going to work in as many ways. Um, there are some newer ones where they are Kind of, I think it's just from like seeing people use chemical exfoliants on their armpits and seeing that that works. Um, so there are some natural deodorants that have um, chemical exfoliants in them. And that seems to work a bit better because then, yeah, you're covering up the smell, plus you're also reducing the, um, the BO causing bacteria in your armpits. So I would probably maybe try one of those instead, something that has acids in it to have that extra mechanism going. Right. Is... Is that body odor, is that normal? You know, my friend Paul Saladino likes to say online that if if we smell, then there's a problem with our health and that we if we're healthy, we we don't actually need deodorant. What do you what do you think about that? Um like the things you eat do change the way you smell because like you'll excrete different substances. Um, and it is generally the um, what's sort of like known as stress sweat um, that has more of the BO causing chemicals in it. Um, whereas thermal sweat, which is the stuff you put out to try to cool down, that tends to have less of those substances. So, um, but I don't think that's really like a health or unhealthy thing because, like, even if we go back to um, early on evolution, like if you see a lion, you're going to stress, so you're going to produce that. So I, yeah, I don't think it's really like a health thing. Mm. And there are tons of healthy foods that cause like your excretions to smell like onion, garlic, um, that sort of thing is linked to more BO. Um, and those are perfectly healthy. Okay, good. Okay. So we can keep wearing deodorant. Um, my friends and family will be happy about that. Um, I'm conscious of time here. I, I want to kind of finish with a more philosophical question. And, and I think you kind of went there a little bit earlier, um, focusing on the beauty construct as a whole. So I'm interested in your sort of perspective, and, and I know that you will have given thought to this. Does uh, society, and in particular the beauty industry, place too much emphasis on how we look? versus kind of how we feel and and who we are um, and this kind of link between femininity and in particular, which is kind of linked quite tightly to beauty that I'm sure leads to uh, insecurities, feelings of inadequacy that then drives consumption. So how do you kind of feel about the beauty construct as, as a whole and what message, I guess, would you like to leave listeners with, particularly young females who are exposed to a lot of marketing um, in this uh, industry or from this industry and, and maybe are feeling insecure or inadequate? That's a really tricky topic. And yeah, I, it is something that I think about a lot um, as someone who is involved in marketing beauty products, essentially. Um, and I think it is really difficult. Um, Society and beauty marketing, all of this, a lot of it is based around um, how we look. And I think it's something that is very difficult to avoid. Like, again, in terms of evolution, there are just so many ways that um, we rely on vision 
and we rely on looking at people and judging them by their appearance, by their facial expressions. Um, yeah, so I think it is something that will never completely go away. Um, but at the same time, it is something that doesn't have to be exploited. And I think the beauty industry does exploit it a lot to make you buy products because if you feel insecure, you will buy more products to try to make yourself look different. Um, there are lots of moves towards more inclusivity in beauty, um, but I think a lot of it is also just from a marketing angle. Um, there's lots of pushes to include more diverse um, in terms of ethnicity, in terms of body size, um, even in terms of things that um, are like have been pathologized for a long time, like acne. Um, Statistically, I believe it's something like more than 50% of women have acne at some point in their lives. Um, so it seems really silly to pathologize it. More than 90% of women will have cellulite. And that, again, is something like there's so many cellulite treatments out there. Um, so I think with beauty and with most things, if it is causing you um, a lot of insecurity and psychological distress, um, I think it's a good idea to try to work on that rather than just try to add more and more um, products and try to change how you look. Because, yeah, um, a lot of it can be, I guess, like, I guess there's kind of two options. You can either change your outside to um, what your inside wants or you can change your inside until you are happy with the outside. And I think both of these have to coexist. Like, um, I think there is a lot of the time people do tend to focus on the consumption side because that is how our society is set up versus the um, inner work side. Um, and consumption is often like, it does seem a lot easier to just buy a product and fix your problems rather than actually try to do any sort of introspection and inner work. Um, yeah, so I guess um, my takeaway message is, um, yeah, the beauty industry is trying to exploit your insecurities um, to make you buy more. And maybe if, Seeing um, social media, seeing advertisements is making you feel really bad about yourself. Um, maybe change your consumption habits. Maybe think about whether or not you would be actually better off stepping away a bit and getting a bit more perspective. Mm, thank you. Really appreciate that. I think that perspective is a great way to 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 wind things up here. And and once again, uh, I appreciate you and all of the the knowledge that you're sharing both last episode this episode and everything that you you do online i know you put so much hard work into deciphering the science and helping people make sense of things in, in what is a very tricky category so uh, once again thank you so much for coming back on and joining us i hope that we can do this again in the future um, remind folks if they want to connect with you where they can can kind of do that online I'm Lab Muffin Beauty Science on Instagram. Um, I think YouTube, I think on TikTok, on Twitter, I think I'm Lab Muffin and my website is labmuffin.com. But if you just Google Lab Muffin, you should find me everywhere. Thanks, Michelle. Thank you for joining me for this episode and your interest in science-based conversation. I hope you enjoyed it and found the information covered interesting and instructive. If you did and you'd like to show your support for the show, please subscribe to our YouTube channel where you can stay up to date with new episodes and watch them in video format. Yes, the full length videos. Please also consider subscribing to the show on the Spotify and or Apple podcast app, wherever you enjoy listening to podcasts. You can also leave a review on Apple or Spotify. Again, a great way to support the show and make our content more discoverable for others to enjoy and learn from. If you have any comments about the episodes, suggestions for future episodes, including guests you'd like to see on the show, or questions that you'd like to have answered, please leave those in the comments section on YouTube. I myself and my team will take note of these comments when planning future episodes. Finally, the best way to support the show and receive discounts on products we love is by checking out our sponsors at theproof.com forward slash friends. Enjoy your week, stay well, and I look forward to catching you in the next episode.